So let's do a real quick snippet over the two scales that we've kind of talked about with neurological assessment. Uh, a lot of people get these confused or kind of like, okay, what in the world? There's all these numbers. So hopefully we can simplify things a little bit and make it where it makes more sense. So when we're looking at these scales, your first question may be, well, what's the purpose? Why am I learning this? And the reason that we're learning this is because both these scales you'll probably see and use on a regular basis um, as a nurse, especially the Glasgow Coma Scale. So all these numbers, as much as they seem very overwhelming, they all serve a purpose because we're really going to be looking at these numbers for changes to tell us how a person's functioning. So that's to say that someone could have, you know, a low Glasgow Coma Scale or a poor Stroke Scale score, and that could still be consistent. That could be what we expect. Maybe they just got out of surgery. Maybe, um, you know, like I said, it's expected. Someone who had a stroke, they're going to have deficits. So um, we're not necessarily as worried about the number itself as we are about uh, major changes, because the changes in these scales are going to be what tells us, you know, how the person is functioning. Um, we, it really just helps to get that baseline to understand, you know, are things getting better or are things getting worse? Um, so these scales help us to trend that information. And when we're looking at the Glasgow Coma Scale or GCS, this is really telling us how awake our patient is, their level of consciousness, um, how much is their brain over, overall functioning, you know, are they able to do basic operations? Um, and we're going to do a GCS on a patient pretty much daily basis. You know, um, every patient gets some sort of um, neurological assessment every shift, and the GCS is usually a part of that. Now, sometimes they're going to be done more frequently, but this is the one out of these two, this is the one you're going to use more frequently and should be more familiar with because um, you're going to need it every single day. Uh, the NIH stroke scale, it's also a neurological assessment, um, but it's more assessing damage. It's looking for defects specifically after a stroke. So, um, you know, while the Glasgow Coma Scale is for any patient, whether they have a problem or not, whether they're normal or abnormal, the stroke scale um, is really looking at patients that have had strokes, whether they're getting better or worse or, you know, kind of what their baseline functioning is. So most of the time we want to know what uh, good is, you know, so okay, so which, which number do I want to have? Um, and keep in mind there's a lot of outside factors that can affect these scores. So, you know, someone could have a low Glasgow Coma Scale score, but maybe they just got out of surgery, maybe they had an injury and so it's expected. Um, you know, there could be so many things, um, a sedation and other factors that could cause them to have a different score, um, but it's not necessarily a sign that they have poor functioning. So we always have to correlate it, you know, with that clinical picture. Um, so with a Glasgow Coma Scale, higher is good. It's higher functioning. So if you have a Glasgow Coma Scale of 15, you have all of your ducks in a row. You're good to go. Um, the lower it is, usually it's more low functioning, which means you know, you're not as awake. You're not able to um, function at the same level that uh, most people should be able to. Um, and again, there could be a lot of reasons for that. So that's why we trend this. We watch it. Is it close to what they were doing before? Is it a major change? Um, but um, effectively, for Glasgow Coma Scale, High is good, low is bad. On the other hand, NIH stroke scale is the opposite. Um, the higher your NIH stroke scale is more deficits, whereas the lower is less deficits. Um, so effectively, we're going to, uh, we want the opposite. We do not want a high stroke scale score. We would like the low stroke scale, scale uh, low stroke scale score. Yeah, say that five times fast. Um, so yeah, so it's just kind of important to know, you know, what normal is. So for the Glasgow Coma Scale, uh, we want to rate them on the best that they can do. So we are looking for their best performance. So this means when we're going in and doing our assessment, if we're doing, um, you know, this assessment on them and they can do, um, you know, some things sometimes, other things other times, we want to give them a rating based on the best, um, you know, ability they have in each of these functionings. And the three components are going to be eye-opening, speech, and motor. Um, so let's break down each of these uh, into its respective parts. So for eye-opening, you can be rated on four different levels. You can be spontaneous, which means you go in the room, their eyes are automatically open. They're looking right at you, or as soon as you open that door, you know, it kind of uh, wakes them up and they're looking right at you. They can open their eyes without any um, outside stimulus or um, anything like that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, for uh, the next level down is to speech. This means you're going in the room and they're still not um, waking up just by you entering the room. And then you just have to say their name or, you know, um, just a gentle, you know, reminder kind of to wake them up. So this means they might be a little bit more decreased level of consciousness. You have to say something to get them to open their eyes. Uh, then there's also uh, the next level down, which is to pain. 
um, into pain, that's really talking um, that we have to do some sort of physical stimuli to get them to open their eyes. So we always start with the least invasive first. So we'll start by, you know, kind of doing a light tap on their shoulder. And then if they don't respond to that, um, we may try like a little pinch on their arm. If that doesn't work, we start going to deeper stimulation to see if they respond. Um, so this might include what we call a trapezius spent, uh, pinch, excuse me, trapezius pinch. Um, where we literally take our fingers like we're going to pinch um, and we're going to put our hands, you put your thumb into that little groove that's, uh, you know, on the top of your shoulder. Um, and then you put your the other part of your hands on your uh, back shoulder muscle and then you squeeze. So you're kind of pretty much squeezing their shoulder muscle. Um, and that hurts. You can go ahead and try it. It's not pleasant. Um, we can also do what's called, um, a, you know, a put. Uh, we can also do a, a sternal rub, which is where we pretty much um, make a fist with our hand and we push down um, on their breastbone, you know, in between their chest and push hard and rub on that sternum. People don't like that either, by the way. So um, you can draw all these things on yourself. They're not fun. Um, another option, too, is we can put pressure on their supraorbital notch. Is That's taking your thumb and feel on your eyebrow. You should feel about midway um, across there's a notch in your eyebrow. Push on that with your thumb. Again, not pleasant. But the, all these are ways that we can elicit pain and see if they open their eyes. Now, we're not gonna, this is not the first thing we're going to try. Again, we're going to start with least invasive first. Do they open their eyes on their own? Maybe can they wake up to speech? If that doesn't work, then we go to pain. Um, it is possible that this person could have no eye opening, that they're unable to open their eyes at all. Uh, the next level is going to be, uh, uh, the next um, area is going to be speech that we're going to evaluate. So we're going to start talking to the patient. We're going to see, are they oriented? Can they answer all orientation questions? Um, and if they can't, then are they confused? Can they answer questions, but they're not answering them correctly? They don't know who they are, you know, where they are, or what day it is. Um, words is going to be where they uh, are saying just like kind of broken words. So they might say like pain, bathroom, but they're not forming full sentences. Um, Incomprehensible speech is more like moaning, um, you know, like where they're not really saying words. They're kind of just, um, uh, what do you call it, mumbling or saying things that don't make sense. Um, and then they could also have no speech. Let's talk about motor. This one gets a lot of people confused. Um, and you're not going to be able to understand all of this right away. You have to see this, um, you know, many times and do this assessment a lot to really kind of get the handle of what it looks like. Um, so the best thing that you can have for motor is obeying commands. That means if I asked you to give me a thumbs up, stick out your tongue, wiggle your toes, you can do that. Uh, the next level down is going to be what's called localizing. And this means, you know, you feel me touching or doing something to you. So if I pinched your arm, you're going to reach up and try to knock my hand away or grab towards wherever my hand is. You feel where I'm touching you. Um, and so it's an actual, like, more purposeful response. Like, you're, like, trying, you're saying, hey, I don't like this, trying to get it away. Um, kind of like you can see in this picture, there's the guy who's putting his hand up towards his face because he feels, um, you know, that pressure on his um, uh, eyebrow from that person touching him. Um, the next level is withdrawal, and this is kind of in this picture, it's showing like it's doing pressure on the nail beds, and this means, um, you know, if I was doing the same thing, like let's say I was pinching your arm, um, you know, with localizes, when I pinch your arm, you're trying to knock my hand away. With withdrawals, you're just bringing your arm toward your body. You're saying, ooh, I can feel the stimuli, but you're not actually trying to um, stop me from doing it. You're just bringing your, uh, you know, that wherever that stimulus is, you're just kind of withdrawing or bringing in that limb towards your body. Um, then there's two types of posturing, and these types of posturing, they always get everyone kind of confused and mixed up. So first there's decorticate posturing, and this is what's called um, abnormal flexion. And that's where, you know, you're actually bringing both of your arms in, um, usually, um, and in response to a stimulation, um, you're going to um, bring your arms in and kind of curl them, like think to corticate, like C for core. Um, you're going to kind of, your hands are going to be kind of curled in towards your body, um, protecting your core. Um, so I always remember to corticate, you're protecting your core, you're bringing your arms in to cover over your chest and protect your core organs. Um, and so any type of posturing is abnormal. So with the withdrawals, like you're like, hey, I, I sense a stimulation um, and you're kind of um, withdrawing from it. So but with a decorticate posturing, this flexion, this is abnormal. This is like a lower brain response that um, the body is trying to, in a way, protect itself. Um, but it is not a normal brain function. It's not something that you and I will do. This is what happens when we start to have very bad brain damage. 
Um, then there's decerebrate prostering, and if you can see in this picture, um, it's the man all the way in the lower left, and that's him. You can see his arms are extended out. So decorticate posturing, it's in towards the core, um, you know, kind of protecting our chest. Where decerebrate posturing, it's the worst po type of um, posturing that you can have, um, and it's where you are no longer protecting your core. Your arms are extended, they're out, um, away from your body, and um, a lot of people remember decerebrate because your hands kind of turn out like E's. It's like E and decerebrate, where like the C and decorticate is like the core. Um, so sometimes that's one way that people remember this one. Um, keep in mind, this is not a perfect thing, and sometimes one person may say, oh yeah, it looks like posturing. Another person like, no, that's withdrawals. So we always chart what we see um, when we're doing this assessment. But keep in mind, you know, the best response is always going to be someone responding in a normal way or, you know, actually um, doing something more purposeful versus some of these other responses, which are just like a reflex, like it's just the body responding in a reflexive action. Of course, the lowest wolf motor will be no response at all to any stimulation. So when talking about the NIH stroke scale, um, there is, um, you know, many, many different parts. You know, it's a 15 um, part scale, um, but we're going to just kind of touch on some of the parts of this. So um, we're going to look for this patient who's recently had a stroke. You know, are they awake? You know, when we go in kind of like the same we do for the Glasgow Coma Scale. We're also going to ask them their orientation questions, ask them to follow commands just like we do for GCS. Um, we're going to check uh, a little bit more in depth now. So we're going to start by looking in their um, eye movement. So we're going to maybe ask them to follow our pen. Like, can you watch um, my pen, um, you know, and see if their eye, eyes are actually able to follow it? Like, do they have um, normal eye movement? Can their eye move to every side, like each side of their visual field? Um, and then we would also look for a loss of vision, you know, kind of check their peripheral vision, see if there's any um, deficit in their uh, visual gaze. Because people with strokes can have what's called homonymous hemianopsia, and um, what that is is effectively um, uh, there's a, like a blindness in half of the visual field. So this is one way that we might assess for that is that we're going to be um, seeing if they can see our um, finger in all different areas of their visual field. Uh, the next step is going to be looking at a lot of weakness and motor function. So we're going to start with their face and see if they can smile, raise their eyebrows, um, see how their function is there um, in their facial muscles. Um, we're also going to check the motor function of their arm and their leg, and we're looking for what's called drift. And what that is is if you stick your arm straight up in the air, um, we call them, a, a patient that's had a stroke might have what's called drift, and that means after they put their arm up in the air that their arm is slowly or quickly, um, you know, drifting back to the bed. Um, so effectively, we're looking to see their uh, motor and muscle strength in their arms and their legs, and in the arms, we usually have them hold for 10 seconds, and the legs, we have them hold for 5 seconds. Um, then we want to look for ataxia or their general coordination of their movement, and we do this by having them take their heel and rub it down their leg to see if they can coordinate that activity. And we'll also check their sensory function to see if there's any decreased sensation. So we can do this with a cotton swab. Um, sometimes we'll do it with a like a blunt needle, something like that, depending on their function. Um, and we're just kind of seeing, you know, do they have a decreased sensation on one side versus another? Um, can they feel what we're doing? Uh, the last parts of the NIH scale are going to be, you know, looking at general cognitive and language functioning. So they're going to be given this um, little handout thing here. They're going to have to look at this picture in the upper left corner and discern, like, what's going on or what's wrong. Like, oh, yeah, there's, like, a sink overflowing with water. The kid's trying to get some cookies and about to fall off the stool. You know, we're trying to get to see, do they see, like, what's going on in that situation? Um, we'll ask them to read some sentences, the you-know-how, down-to-earth, I got home from work, kind of seeing um, their ability to speak. And then also um, uh, their ability to identify objects. Like, do they know what a glove is? Do they know what a key is? Do they know what a chair is? And I always thought it was funny that they have a hammock in here because I'm thinking, you know, a lot of people might not even know what a hammock is or is a hammock, you know, just a, um, you know, a certain cultural thing. But um, yes, it is another thing that patients have to identify. Uh, we're also going to check for dysarthria, and we're going to have them say words that are going to be hard to do if they have dysarthria. And remember, dysarthria is a lack of articulation. So words like mama, tip top, 50-50, thanks. Try to say those words yourself now. You have to really enunciate them. Um, and so if someone has dysarthria, they're going to have a lot of trouble with those words. 
Um, and last but not least, we're going to do uh, look for neglect or lack of perception. So we're going to kind of see, you know, can they, um, are they giving attention to both of their um, visual fields? Are they neglecting one of their sides? Um, pretty much going back to, remember, neglect is not a visual problem, it's a perception problem. Um, so uh, they are going to um, have trouble giving attention to one side of their um, uh, of the world effectively. And usually it's going to be that left side that they're neglecting. Um, so yeah, so we just want to um, assess for that, kind of seeing if they can um, distinguish um, things within their visual field, if they're looking, um, uh, able to uh, give attention to both sides. Um, so that's just a real quick snippet. I know it was short, down, and dirty, um, but keep in mind, you know, at this level, we really just want you to understand, you know, what are going to be the signs um, that things are getting worse. And, you know, it's all about, you know, trending those scores and watching and seeing what's changing in the patient. Um, neurological assessments are going to be hard. Like I said, some people may rate differently, um, but you've just got to, you know, use uh, the, uh, hone these skills. And the more that you do it, the more that you see it, the more that it will make sense to you. Um, and it's really important at this level just to know, you know, what's good and what's bad. You know, what's the difference between someone who's getting better and someone who's getting a lot worse. Um, I hope this was helpful.